Bonsoir, good evening. Very happy to see you, very important people. Uh, I'm sure you know now the slogan of the IEC this year, the space for all. And what does that mean for us? Space for all means for space for all in inhabitants of the planet Earth. The planet Earth is the only one we have, and we want to stay on the planet Earth. That's very important to know. Of course, we love exploring. Of course, we, we love the Artemis rockets with the European Space Agency logo on the top. We are very proud of that. Europe is back. Thank you, Isa. Thank you, Mr. Aschbacher. And thank you, ADS Deutschland and the city of Bremen. Europa is back. And space industry is now a data-driven industry. That's a new model. We're not talking about infrastructure. We're talking about value. We're talking about data. The value proposal is now the quantity and the quality of space satellite data, data we can deliver. Sat satellite data now as a more effective whistleblower regarding global warming. Satellite data is a fantastic accelerator for health industry, agriculture, mobility, urbanism. So let's begin our journey with scientists, urbanists, start up developing new solutions for our planet. Let's begin with the blue dot, the ocean planet. Francois, the deep sea is less now today than the moon. How can we better discover the ocean planet? What are the coming challenges for you? Good evening. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about the ocean, the, the blue planet. So um, I'm from Ifremer. Ifremer is the French research institute, which is fully dedicated to marine science and technology. And we have uh, been having a long-standing collaboration with uh, CNES, uh, the host of this uh, Congress. Um, at Ifremer, at our raison d'être is uh, threefold with scientific knowledge at the core. Um, the first raison d'être is about the, the managing, the management, the sustainable management, and we emphasize the sustainable aspect of uh, marine resources, be they uh, biological, uh, I'm speaking, for example, of fisheries, or uh, be they um, uh, physical, for example, uh, uh, marine renewable energies, I'm speaking of uh, wind energy. Uh, the second raison d'etre is about the protection and the restoration of the ocean. We are more and more speaking of the restoration of the ocean, uh, while also protecting the human population from the marine hazards, marine risks, because there are some. And the third, and here there are many uh, connections with uh, space, uh, is about sharing the marine scientific data and the information and services that are derived therefrom. Uh, and we share them with the uh, public authorities, private companies, NGOs, and the civil society at large. So, but what about our challenges more precisely? The, the first is a sort of nexus of um, environmental issues um, which are interconnected. Biodiversity. Uh, the ocean is the largest biome on the Earth, 70.8% uh, 70 uh, 70 of the Earth is ocean. More than 97% of the water is salted, uh, and the ocean plays a key role in the global water cycle. So biodiversity definitely is important. Climate, second, uh, the ocean absorbs more than 90% of the excess of heat due to uh, global warming and our uh, greenhouse gases emissions, but also absorbs, and this is a threat to the ocean, around 30% of the carbon that we uh, emit uh, every year in the atmosphere. Food, of course, the ocean provides about uh, 17 to 18% uh, uh, of animal proteins that we eat, and pollution, and uh, there are many pollutions that uh, affect the ocean. Uh, we often speak of plastic pollution, but uh, there are also chemical pollutions in different types. And so understanding the impact of these pollution, reducing and stopping the, the new pollutions and contaminations, but also monitoring fisheries and uh, reducing and, and uh, overfishing. Um, well, these are goals that we do have. So the, the first challenge is, is about this nexus of, of environmental issues. Um, the second point, it, it's, it's more a bit fundamental. The ocean is still unknown. There are only six men and one woman who have dived to the depth of the Mariana Trench, more about 11,000 meters under the sea surface. And of course, none of them has walked there. 
fortunately for them. And only 20% of ocean seafloor has been mapped with some precision. Um, we know about uh, 240,000 marine species, but uh, we estimate that there are more than 1 million, maybe between 1 and 10 million of marine species, and I'm not speaking here of microorganisms, I'm not speaking of bacteria, I'm not speaking of viruses, just of well, normal species somehow. Uh, so there are plenty of things which are still to be discovered, to be deciphered, to be understood. And, um, for example, the, the mechanisms of life. Uh, here you have uh, deep sea environments that you see some... The, the things that you see there are 2,000 meters or 3,000 meters uh, uh, deep under the sea surface. Um, so there are plenty of things that are to be uh, understood. For example, how life uh, evolves at 2,000 met uh, meter depth, how the organisms uh, move, uh, that's, that's a mm -hmm. pure scientific uh, challenge. So that, um, it's very clear to me uh, that uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, I lost a thing. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, it's very clear to me that the ocean who has been, still is, and will remain for a while a frontier of science. Uh, the third challenge that we do face is technological, and there are some links with space there, mm -hmm. um, because the access to the ocean is very difficult, um, because it may be rough on the surface, that's for true for the sailors, but also because of the constraints which are imposed by darkness, by high pressure, and because the usual communication means do not operate. I would just like to take an example so that you understand the kind of difficulty that we do face. Um, you may know that in 2018, there was a, a low-intensity seismic crisis that started uh, somewhere in the Indian Ocean on Mayotte Island. So the, there were earthquakes, earth sh shakes every day, every day, low intensity, not very high, but every day, several times, sometimes a day. Uh, of course, there was a monitoring on land of uh, what was happening there, but nobody really understood. So we had to set up, uh, um, so we, the scientists from CNRS, from IFEMER, from other research organizations in France, said well, something must hap happen somewhere in the sea. So we organized a campaign there. Uh, we, we, have, we took the Marion Dufresne, uh, which is a 100 meter uh, long uh, research vessel, and, and the scientists went on the sea knowing that something was happening, but they didn't know exactly what. And they discovered a submarine volcano, 3,000 meters under the sea surface. And this volcano had emerged in 2018. It was 800 meters high, three to four kilometers of diameter, so something very big, something that happens every four to 500 years. So something very special, exceptional. Since that date, we have been organizing uh, uh, more than 20 new campaigns to monitor the situation there. This is something that is not visible. Would it have, if, it had, if this had happened on, on the continent, we would have monitored that from the space. In that situation, we had to, uh, well, to, to go there. And now we are going to uh, uh, organize um, new, new systems to monitor the situation. Uh, the good thing is that the crisis has diminished, but we are uh, going to organize a deep sea observatory, mm -hmm. which will be a cabled observatory. Um, we are also planning to construct a sort of uh, submarine glider, which will fly over the volcano. Uh, so th these are the kind of technological developments that we are doing. And some of these developments have uh, some similarities with what the people in the space that you are doing somehow. So these are a few examples. Maybe the last, the last uh, uh, challenge I wanted to, to mention, which may have some echo for you, um, mixes uh, geopolitics and security. Um, the ocean uh, both separates the continents and the countries, but it also uh, unifies the world. This is a sort of bridge between the populations and culture. So that we often consider the, the ocean as a common good. But on the other side, uh, for, for example, most of the intercontinental data flow mm. in, 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 under the sea through uh, deep sea cables. Uh, but this uh, common good and the fruit territory uh, is now coveted by more and more people and countries. So we are facing more and more uh, 
security and safety issues and 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 there this is a new challenge where the links between the, the civil society on the side and, and the defense on the other side is increasingly important. So here are a few challenges, Jill. Okay. Um, four years ago, I remember I was a sailor on a, on a super tanker. I remember I have to ask uh, saint Lys Radio near Bordeaux to have connection with France. Uh, how do you see the evolution of uh, the ocean research regarding space industry, regarding the space solution for your, for your research, for your daily job? Um, so th there are many links between space and oceanography, if, if this is your point. What, what the first thing is that, um, which is important, is that people are curious. They are curious about the ocean and they are curious about uh, the space. And so this is a sort of similarity that does exist. Um, the second thing is, uh, which I already mentioned, is the, the kind of um, uh, parallel in terms of technological developments. Uh, robots, we are developing robots. You are developing other types of robots under different constraints, but there are here some similarities. Um, I mentioned the case of um, this uh, observatory that we are going to set up off Mayotte. Uh, we are setting up different types of observatories. The one in Mayotte will be cabled, but some other observatories are not cabled. Um, 2,000 meters under the sea, we have some instruments, sensors, um, but um, it's in the middle of the Atlantic, so there is no point of having a, a, a constant uh, link with the continent. So the link is with the surface to a buoy, and then the data they flow uh, to, the, to, to, to the continent through the satellite. So here we see clearly links. Uh, another example of links that we do have in 2018, if I'm right, uh, the year I joined Ifremer, there was the launch of a satellite which is Cefosat. Cefosat was, uh, uh, this is a, a French-Chinese partnership, uh, and, uh, but uh, the, um, the one of the instruments, which is a swim instrument, so this is a, a satellite for monitoring the waves and the wind at the sea surface. And one of the instruments, uh, of course, we're using the data because this is important for us to, to monitor what happens with the, well, the waves, that's our, that's our job. But so we also helped designing the, the satellite. So uh, we see here again another type of links that we do have. Um, maybe last, um, another point where we have some strong connections is sea level rise. Uh, if, uh, of course, climate change induces um, uh, sea level rise for various reasons, the measurement of sea level rise comes from satellite data, not from buoys, that comes from altimetry. That's definitely from space. But to understand the reason for which the sea level rises, you need to have floats which are present permanently in the sea. And there is an array of more than 4,000 floats at any moment, just at this moment, we are at sea, globally, in the Pacific, in the Indian and the Atlantic Ocean. And these floats measure the, the temperature of the ocean. And if we hadn't these, flo these floats, these 4,000 floats, and each float is about between 10,000 and 100,000 euros. So in the end, it makes um, some sort of an amount of money where to renew them every three years. If we had not these floats, we would not be able to understand whether the sea level rise is linked to the thermal expansion of the water or whether it is linked to the melting of uh, the ice sheet or the melting of the glaciers or linked to the retention of inland waters. So. Here, definitely, we see that there is a close link between what you do in the space community and what we are doing in the ocean community. Uh, if we had only in-situ data, we would not be able to measure the elevation. With the special data, we can do that, but we had, if we had only the special data, we would not understand the reason of this evaluation. So, so I think this, this is an, a link. And maybe the last thing is that um, uh, where there are links and, and common challenges, is, uh, it's about um, what we call digital twin of the ocean. Mm. Uh, uh, there are digital twins of everything now, but of course. But uh, the, uh, there will be not only one digital twin of the ocean, there will be several. Uh, there will be global ocean, and there will be a digital twin of the Mediterranean or very small areas. But um, here we need again to, to, to bring together a lot of data, in situ oceanographic data, as the one of the 
floats I just mentioned, but also special data. We will need uh, models. We will need to somehow merge these models and data together, and then we will need to build scenarios. And I'm very sure that uh, the, the special uh, scientists, as well as the ocean, ocean scientists, will have to collaborate to, to develop that kind of digital twins in, in the future. So I don't know whether this this addresses your question, but I think I, th I see yeah, plenty, plenty of contacts that we will develop in the future there. Okay, thank you, thank you. Connie, I think we share the same passion for the city, for the diverse rise and of city in the day and night. You are pushed in, uh, in your, you are architect and you are, you are a student in Germany and in France, in Toulouse, very important city for the space industry. And you, you approach the sensitive city on its diverse rhythm in daily life. You also include the topolar analysis in your reflection for what you call a sustainable city. Can you describe your job? We see uh, the Paris uh, Seine Bank. And how do you, see, how do you, do you see your, your role to, to build up a new city, to take care of new horizon. And uh, uh, can, can you explain what, what is the job, daily job? Yeah, so first of you, thank you for the invitation and uh, for the challenging task to define <laughs> an urban path here in such an international context. And every one of you is probably imagining or thinking of another city. So at first, there's not uh, one urban path. And I won't uh, talk only about the urban path in Paris, but more in a general way. Um, if I would ask you to describe a city, I'm pretty sure that you will start describing monuments or other spatial characteristics. And just to precise, when I'm talking about spatial, it's not the same space as you're talking about. It's more about urban space in the most part of my um, daily life. So, as of course, I agree as an architect that spatial characteristics are part of the local identity of the city. But especially for me in Paris, living here in Paris, it was really even more marking the, the daily rhythm and this pulse of the city to live it every day and beyond the, the nice context of the buildings and the public space. And I took three dimensions, how you can describe or we can analyze such an urban pulse because it's quite a subjective uh, topic. So the first one, we can observe human urban life. So how do inhabitants, workers, tourists, we're all around the city and at which time of the day do they move in the night because maybe the climatic uh, conditions needed or are they more up in the morning and you can really have a look at the city in different ways. The second one is the logistic urban life. So how do goods or resources move around the city or are they depending, for example, from um, and harbor or, or some other logistic um, elements. And the third one, the non-human urban life, so nature and climatic pulsations. It depends on the, day, on the moment of the day or at the season of the year. You won't have the same sound, the same ambience in the city, and it will even impact our use of the public space because buildings, it's an artificial surrounding, so the, the use will be the same in, at the whole year. But uh, at least the public space is used differently at, same, at the different times of the day, at different uh, times of the year. So in this way, we, you will have many, many different uh, urban pulses and urban rhythms. But there's one common point that many of them share. Not all of them, but in general, we say that in comparison to an, an industrial period where the rhythm was quite uh, imposed by one factory, it's like a monochronic rhythm. And nowadays, we are more talking about the puzzles. Everyone has his own rhythm. We have s several different workers and we have so many different kinds of jobs that there's more a puzzle of several individual rhythms. And that's to, um, mentioned the polychronic uh, character. And this is quite an established point of view, and I do share this point of view in a certain way, but nonetheless, each time I have to move in Paris during the rush hours, and I'm sure no other cities where you're coming from, you will share the same point. When you're stuck in your car, on your bike, or stuck in the public transport, I'm always struggling with this point. Everyone is talking about individualized rhythms, and in the end, we're still stuck at the same time. So in the end, we might be even more synchronized or still some synchronized and have this tiring experience of congestion. And really, this, 
is a loss of quality of life and really impacting our uh, quality of life in the city. And it's not only this uh, congestion stress in the term of traffic, but also in other points of view. The, the term we are analyzing uh, with, um, at a university, it's the urban saturations. It's not only the streets that are saturated, but it's also us, maybe mentally, but also physically. We, ha we struggle to find an affordable flat in the city. We struggle to find a, a calm spot in the park, maybe, because everyone wants to go out uh, in the park having a cool spot when our flats are too hot, maybe, in the summer. So there are many small points that can sum up to a kind of um, subjective feeling of uh, mental tiredness and urban saturation, like I call it in my work. And, um, and on the one hand, I really, com I really understand this point of view because I'm living it all day. But on the other hand, I'm an architect and an urban planner. And I have a certain responsibility to design the future city and the non-built and built around surroundings. And in this way, I can't agree that people will leave the cities because of this urban saturation and the loss of quality of life. Because if we believe the United Nations reports, the future of, you, of the world population will be urban. So it will be a challenge. And on the, we know also that uh, the urban density and this intensity, diversity, it is also a chance at really a quality to, to develop a sustainable city. So we know that we need in the, in the density, and I do agree, we need it. Not only, but we do need it. But on the other hand, we really have to cope and to improve the quality of life for, for the people. And uh, one point that I'm working on as an architect, yes, I'm, I'm working on the space and on the buildings. But on the other hand, it's really time to recognize the, the, the importance of time and rhythms. If I can follow my own rhythm, maybe I can uh, avoid the traffic jams in the morning. So that's a hard task for policy, uh, yeah, policies, for economy, for entrepreneurs, for ourselves to manage our rhythms like we can. And also for my discipline as an urban planner, but in this way we also have to change uh, our methods and our tools to work with because time is not always part of, of um, yeah, our, I don't know, daily tools. Yeah. Okay, then uh, you're talking about sensitive city, you're talking about precision, rhythm, city rhythm. What about satellite? Is it? able to monitor this pulsation, city pulsation with satellite or to, to, to help us to, to, to build up a new city with a satellite, data, a satellite data? Yeah, before talking about the new city and uh, the quality of life in those new cities, it's, the first point is that we have to guarantee the livability of the cities. So one point we also mentioned it in the different contexts, like in the oceans or other uh, sessions we heard before, we have to cope with the climatic pulsations and with the urban heat stress and urban heat islands. So that's the first part where we as an urban planner, we really need the help of satellites and of space research. Uh, for example, we have to control urban sprawl and we can do um, reglementations to avoid urban sprawl, but it's difficult to, to track it. And in this case, uh, satellites really help to document and to analyze the, the land use. And um, for example, with the Copernicus monitoring program, and also the point is that we can really use it. Even my, as a student, I can use the Urban Atlas, which is online, and I can really have a look at the uh, surroundings in my projects. And other, uh, like for example, the French public agency, CIRIMA, and other, like I just uh, learned that other startups are working on it as well. They use the data of this urban atlas from the land monitoring program in combination with geographic and other morphologic data. And in this way, they really can map urban heat islands. So we can know as a planner where we have to intervene. It's impossible to know or to analyze us without, without these data. And then another point is we have to um, increase the surface of non-seed land and the presence of trees. And uh, yeah, like for example, there's the CNES who's working with the, the city of Paris and to, to map the, the tree patrimony of the city. And it's really more efficient and it's also on, on private land. We won't be able to map this when we are on our feet as a pedestrian. So it's really one point 
to identify the points and where, the, where we lack trees, for example, for improving and the, or even guaranteeing the livability of our cities. Otherwise, we won't even beyond the, the congestion stress and the urban saturation, we wouldn't be able to live in the city. So that's the first point I would uh, wanted to mention. And the second one is more my own research topic about the urban saturations. Um, there was already the discipline of time geography who will recognize that we have to think time and space together when we are planning. But this was in the 1970s. I know that you already were, was ready to, to um, go to space, but back then, in the 1970s, they didn't really manage to analyze space and time at the same time. Maybe they had, they had the same uh, financial resources. But nowadays, we can easily develop uh, applications when we're doing time use studies. At the same time, we can track the people, so we know what they are doing, how many times they are doing it, and we also know where do they do it. So that's really a good advantage and an easy tool, even if I'm not an engineer. It's a tool that even I can manage. So, And when I'm talking about simple tools, it's also in our daily life. If we want to make use of the real-time crowd information, um, instead of being stuck in a, in a line and waiting, I can have a copy. When I, ha when I have a look at the application, I see that there's a spike of frequentation. And in this way, I will suffer a lot less. And uh, even if I'm coming to a new city, I don't know how many people have been to Paris before, but if you don't know <laughs> where to go and where there are nice places where to have the party, um, you find it online in the, in the maps and you can either join the crowd or avoid the crowd. Yeah, and in, in the same way, I will switch, I think, to Stefan. The Internet of Things and intelligent systems of the, of the, traffic, uh, just, you know, the traffic, traffic management or parking demand. In this way, we can really uh, make the traffic more fluid and uh, avoid a lot of stress. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Stefan, you're in charge of the big company in France. You're located in Toulouse, again, center of the space industry in Europe. Uh, and uh, you're, you're working in the car industry, so important for European economy. Um, what's, what, what are the next challenges to come? You're working about electric cars, you're talking about autonomous cars, you're talking about a lot of things, uh, we're talking about mobility in Europe, new mobility in Europe. What is the next step for a, a firm like Continental? Yeah, there, there are quite a, a few of them. Uh, um, the, the automotive industry is undergoing uh, uh, quite a lot of, of, of changes. Uh, so first to um, locate Continental a little bit and I uh, would like to start with uh, our location in, in Toulouse. We are a worldwide <laughs> company, 200,000 uh, employees, 37 billion of sales, uh, more than 200 locations worldwide. Nevertheless, the Toulouse location uh, was created 42 years ago, uh, 1979. Uh, 1979. Uh, exactly because at that time embedded systems uh, started to, to get uh, uh, into cars and where was the expertise for such embedded systems? In space. And that was exactly the reason why uh, the company at that time decided to go to uh, Toulouse in order to capture this expertise. So you see there are historical uh, um, bridges between our, our different worlds. Now, coming back to your question, uh, first of all, uh, a Continental, we are known for tires, those big black uh, round things. I saw the uh, Rover Perseverance when we uh, uh, came in, so it has six tires because there are six uh, uh, wheels. Uh, very interesting, nevertheless that uh, interesting for us uh, because we are going for volume and on Earth you have more volume, which leads us to uh, uh, giving you an, 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 a short uh, overview of what automotive means uh, on planet Earth. Uh, we build uh, as humans with all those different brands we all know roughly 80 to 90 million light uh, weight cars per year plus 15 million of trucks so more than 100 million of vehicles produced per year uh, 
the, the brands uh, uh, are known. Uh, equipment manufacturers like us, Continental, we uh, equip us and, and our competitors roughly 85% of uh, the average car. So uh, uh, we are not visible, uh, but we are, well, uh, 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 very important for, for the different uh, functionalities in, in a, a given car. Uh, I spoke of tires. Second uh, 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 part of our company is uh, industrial applications. I will not uh, touch base on that one. The third one is the most important one for what uh, is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, important for this uh, uh, round is the uh, uh, original equipment we sell directly to uh, uh, car manufacturers. Uh, and that ranges from brakes to uh, airbag systems, uh, screens in your car, uh, um, whatever electronic uh, hardware and software you need in a car is uh, produced like uh, from, from uh, companies like uh, Continental in this third part we call automotive. So automotive, you, you talked of the challenges, the ta challenges are huge. Uh, let me uh, give you an, an, an just a few uh, well uh, uh, figures uh, with regards to cars. The average family car today uh, is uh, uh, embarking roughly 100 millions of lines of code. Tomorrow, tomorrow being 2025 roughly, we will double to 200 million uh, lines of codes in 2030, so in eight years from now, uh, we expect uh, this same average family size car uh, to have more than a billion lines of code on board. You can imagine the complexity uh, uh, of uh, uh, all this. Uh, just to give the uh, 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 comparison, a uh, uh, fighter plane where everyone might think, wow, it's, it's uh, an absolute uh, object of, of technology, uh, has roughly 22 million, so uh, uh, much lower uh, figure uh, uh, 22 million of line, uh, lines of code. So software is becoming an absolute uh, uh, key element of cars. At a certain stage, software has to go into uh, hardware, into the, the silicone, uh, uh, into microprocessors. Uh, and this is something we, we also do. Uh, we we uh, uh, build, uh, well, all kinds of electronics in cars. So software and hardware uh, uh, expertise will become absolutely crucial and key. Uh, software is embedded software, is middleware, so uh, operating systems, which are nowadays not yet fully rolled out in, in the cars you may drive uh, as of today, but will be in the next uh, years to come, simply because otherwise the uh, connectivity which is needed, uh, which needs uh, quite a lot of... Um, abstraction layers to, to uh, make software and hardware independent one of each other uh, will work. So uh, these are areas we work on and uh, connectivity automatically uh, means, uh, uh, well, link to space for sure. Then connectivity is for us it's very well known. It's the next challenge for space industry, European space and industry. How do you see the connection with uh, uh, your industry and uh, your space industry regarding connect, uh, connectivity, regarding autonomous vehicle? What's the next step? To have a big, camp, big car company invest, uh, in, invest uh, in, a, in a space industry? Or how do you see the connection between space industry and automotive industry? Well, I, I see there are uh, lots of things moving exactly right now. Uh, you, you certainly uh, know about uh, the link between uh, uh, Tesla on the one hand side and SpaceX on the other. Uh, you have certainly all read about uh, Geely being a, a Chinese car manufacturer uh, launching their own uh, constellation. Other uh, players, European players, American players, have announced uh, uh, that they are really uh, uh, analyzing and, and uh, investigating uh, uh, the subject of uh, uh, mainly uh, uh, low Earth orbit uh, constellations uh, and, and the connectivity it can bring to, to, to cars, cars becoming IoT objects. And imagine 100 uh, billion of cars per year produced uh, per day, uh, uh, largely connected in the near future. So uh, uh, the, the uh, 
interchanges, the exchanges between space industry and automotive industry are, I would almost say, at their height for the, for the time being. Now, uh, the devil is in the detail, um, because uh, uh, everyone might think that uh, automotive industry, given the volume we, we just spoke of, can uh, uh, afford, uh, uh, well, whatever uh, cost mm. to, to come to this connectivity. Uh, automotive is a extremely competitive industry. So, uh, uh, there are many, many use cases you can imagine. Uh, all the over-the-air updates for, for new softwares because cars will, thanks to electric uh, uh, propulsion, uh, have a longer lifetime. Uh, an electric motor, everyone knows, that is, uh, can, can work for 20 years without any problem. You might uh, earlier have problems with your suspension or your, your, your electronics, by the way, because it's uh, uh, technology-wise outdated and you will need to, to replace it. Uh, but cars will have a longer lifetime. Now, uh, how to, to come to the fact that uh, the connectivity uh, and the use cases uh, uh, all of us imagine uh, remain uh, cost-effective, that is another story, uh, because um, we all think of... Uh, uh, le let's imagine the, the uh, example of, of uh, software uh, on, on or let's say... Uh, um, uh, uh, mobile phones, for example. A mobile phone weights 200 grams, has uh, one microprocessor, seven sensors. Uh, faulty software uh, is simply annoying. Uh, in a car weighting two tons, uh, 100 uh, uh, microprocessors on board, uh, uh, one, more than 100 sensors, uh, uh, faulty software and uh, not sufficient uh, uh, low latency uh, can be fatal. So uh, uh, the, the safety aspect uh, when it comes to mobility is of crucial uh, importance uh, while needing to be cost effective. Um, now coming back to the use cases, uh, you can imagine tons of use cases. We spoke uh, about one. Uh, car manufacturers are extremely um, uh, uh, curious about what people really use in their cars, for example. Uh, well, they all use uh, brakes. We have to brake from time to time because traffic is slowing down or whatever. But there are so many uh, uh, other uh, uh, functionalities which some people use and others don't. And uh, uh, guess what? We, we do not really know uh, who uh, uh, is using uh, uh, what, how, how often. And connectivity can bring that, uh, that insight, for example. That is one, one use case one might not uh, really uh, think of in a, in a first step. So use cases, there are tons of use cases. They need to be cost effective uh, because uh, uh, competition is, is tough. Second aspect, uh, uh, Connie mentioned, it is... Uh, um, leads us from mobility, mobility being an individual decision to go from a point A to a point B in, in, in urban uh, uh, environment or uh, in, on the countryside. Uh, many, many individual decisions at the same time lead to uh, a collective uh, observation we all can do uh, to congestion and traffic. Uh, and there the, the connectivity between cars, infrastructure, uh, 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 is is of of importance, uh, so uh, infrastructure comes into play uh, uh, also on to, with with this regard. So use cases are tremendously uh, uh, huge, but we need to make sure that they are cost efficient uh, and with the right uh, uh, latency, the right technological answer. And uh, as I said, devil is in the detail. Thank you, Rafaela. Uh, I know we share the same goal to develop the French-German cooperation in the space industry. And uh, perhaps first, can you discuss about what, what, are you, what is your role at your University of Bundeswehr uh, in Munich? And uh, how do you daily work and uh, how do you develop entrepreneurship? Because uh, it's very impressive what you have done regarding entrepreneurship in your, at the University of Bundeswehr. Miko. Yes, university, the, uh, the, thank you for having me at first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And um, yes, University of the Bundeswehr is a quite unique institution in Germany, but also maybe in Europe, because we educate um, officers, future officers of the for, uh, Federal Armed Forces of Germany academically. So it's not a military academy, um, but it's a, a usual university where you can study, for example, uh, space technology or psychology, business administration, and so on. And what is um, for us, uh, and especially for me, I'm professor of business administration, but I'm also responsible for entrepreneurship training and building up the ecosystem of entrepreneurship together with the German Federal Armed Forces. Um, what, what's for me really important is uh, the potential among these young people women and men uh, who are interested technology-wise, but uh, who know also the use cases which are relevant uh, for the military in the future, uh, which we see, for example, now also in the Ukraine war. Um, these young people, they want to work on these ideas and uh, they want to create uh, innovations for their organization. And that's why we are training our uh, students also as intrapreneurs and um, give them the opportunity to, to visit programs where they learn entrepreneurial skills, for example, like design thinking or agile working. Um, what's very interesting, uh, some of them are um, so enthusi enthusiastic about building their own startups that we actually have sometimes the problem to stop them a little bit because they have to serve in the military before they found a business, but some of them do, the, do it afterwards and some really try to um, do these two things together to serve and in the same time build a business. So it's a very interesting ecosystem also for the military and for, the, for our Ministry of Defense. And on the other hand, we are also a technical university with uh, about 1,000 researchers from um, different technical fields, like, for example, um, cybersecurity, space engineering, um, civil engineering. So we have many different fields. And um, my observation is that space technology is kind of an enabler for many of these fields. For example, in civil engineering, we have 3D printing, and we have research about 3D printing in space, actually. And that's what's really um, amazing, I think, scientifically wise, but also when it comes to start businesses, um, that space is, for all these fields, a really important enabler. And we already heard a few examples from, um, from the speakers before um, that there are always connections and you have to find these connections. And that's also um, one of the things we are trying to do. We want to bring people together and to, to, to create new ideas and to find these, uh, find these connections where new ideas for startups spread and can, can be accelerated or incubated in our programs. That's what we are doing. Um, to, to help startups to succeed or at, at first to, to be initiated, but then to, to help them to create really uh, sustainable businesses. Um, the other thing which I find very interesting that space is also um, for, for the Bundeswehr, for the Federal Armed Forces of Germany, also one field which is uh, extremely important for the technological sovereignty. And in my opinion, most innovations, um, maybe you correct me <laughs> afterwards, uh, but most innovations are um, in, in the last years, you can observe that startups are the ones who create these innovations. Everyone knows uh, SpaceX or Tesla, but there are also a lot of examples where uh, the biggest innovations come from players, non-traditional players, not the players from the big companies or from um, big research uh, institutions, but from, from single persons and small businesses, which are created new. 
and that's what we are also trying um, that we we encourage our scientists which have uh, who have uh, great ideas uh, who have research results created during their PhD phase um, to encourage them to put them into um, into into practice yeah that's okay. uh, what we are trying to do at the university okay we, Second question is, you know, what about? It's about Space Founder, you, your creation with the, with the French CNES, yeah. and how you de develop this French German accelerator regarding startup and yeah. develop connection with all the space industry. Yeah, that's uh, an example um, for our programs, but I think it's also the exceptional and, and one of the, the greatest achievements we created together with CNES, uh, the Space Founders Accelerator. And uh, Space Founders Accelerator is an accelerator program especially dedicated to find, um, to, to scout uh, startups in the space technology area. Um, startups from all different um, topics. For example, we had already agriculture, it could be smart cities, it could be mobility startups, and we already have a lot of examples from these fields. Um, it could be downstream or upstream launchers, satellites, uh, small satellites, bigger satellites. So uh, it's, it's really all about space. And um, it's a three month program, which we um, currently are, um, yes, our second batch is, is running currently. And tomorrow uh, we will have the demo day of the second batch where the startups show their results. and. Uh, hopefully get funding from investors from all over Europe. The program is for not only for French and German startups, it's also for uh, startups from Europe and maybe also from <laughs> England. <laughs> and, uh, so we, uh, we are a European accelerator. There are one thing which is also important, it's no strings attached, so we don't take equity from the startups. Um, it's a uh, program which is, um, consists of two intensive weeks in presence, in one in Toulouse and the other one in Munich. And well, tomorrow we will see uh, what happens when, when startups are accelerated in this way. They get a lot of mentor um, sessions. We have about uh, 100 mentors from all different fields of science, but also from the political area. Uh, from the defense area, from the public sector, um, procurement um, experts, and so on. So uh, we will see how everything goes tomorrow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Frédéric. Frédéric. 20 years ago, I was working in every city of south of Paris, developing, trying to develop with uh, Genopole, Bio, the biotech companies and the gen therapy. You were in charge of this business, fantastic business you have done regarding bioproduction. And can you explain the future of medicine, what's going on in gen therapy? And if I may, two words about your father at the beginning. <laughs> yes, well, th thank you, Gilles, for uh, inviting me today. And as you said, I mean, there's a personal link, and I was particularly happy to accept the invitation. M my father was uh, w with the pioneers of uh, space research in France in the 70s. Uh, he was uh, one of the executive directors of CNES starting in the 80s. And uh, he worked at the NASA for several for some time. And I remember with him as a kid uh, during the Apollo mission, in particular Apollo 13, being in the control room. And uh, for me, being here today is really uh, some kind of a legacy to my, to my father. Thank you for <laughs> reminding him. His name was uh, Isaac Riva. Thank you, Jean. And I'll shift gears with Genethon. And yeah. what we're talking here about is really biomedical research. And in particular, at Genethon, we've been pioneers of gene therapy. Uh, and, you know, bear with me for several minutes. What I'm going to tell you about is, for me, as fascinating as uh, a Space Odyssey. <laughs> what are we talking about here? We're talking about a groundbreaking approach to address in a first stage genetic diseases, but now more and more 
uh, frequent and non-genetic diseases. So when we're talking about genetic diseases, what are we talking of? We're talking about a group of 6,000 to 7,000 different diseases which can affect any organ, muscles, brain, eye, skin, liver, whatever organ. These diseases affect 350 million patients worldwide, 30 million in Europe. Two-thirds of them will strike kids uh, below the age of two, and 50% of them uh, are fatal and will lead to death. More than 95% of these diseases have no therapeutic solution. And when at Genethon we embarked in the 90s in the field of gene therapy, it was really going, like going to the moon. I mean, so many people would tell us that it was just not possible, that the principle was simple, but the engineering was uh, too complicated and it would never work. So what are we talking of when we're talking about gene therapy? Genetic diseases are due to a mutation in a given gene, a piece of DNA at the heart of our cells, which presents a defect, a mutation. The idea is to bring to the cells a non-mutated version of the gene, a non-mutated version of this DNA into the cell and thus compensate for the effect of the mutation. Now this appears very simple having said that, but in practice, this is very difficult to uh, put in practice because think about it for a second. We eat DNA all the time and our cells do not accept DNA. When you eat salad, when you eat meat, when you eat chicken, you eat DNA from chicken, DNA from lettuce, and this DNA doesn't go into your cells. And this is a good thing. Just <laughs> imagine for a second what would happen if DNA from chicken would get into your own cells. So cells will not accept foreign DNA. But our foreign DNA, the DNA we want to bring, is therapeutic DNA. We have to bring it there. So in order to bring it into cells, what we're going to use is a tool that is brought to us by nature. And these are viruses. Viruses in nature, their job is to bring their own genes from one cell to another. So what we're going to use here is not native viruses. We never have native viruses in our labs. But what we're going to do is really use the external part of the viruses, put inside the therapeutic gene, the therapeutic DNA, and administer this to patients. So what we're doing here is really a graft. We're grafting a gene to these patients using, as a transporter, the external part of a virus. And this is what you see on the right-hand side of the slide here. This is an image of one of these viruses. Now, these are the most complex species that you uh, have in our uh, therapeutic arsenal, in fact. These are 10,000 times more complex than, let's say, aspirin, Advil, or Prozac, these small chemical molecules. I mean, if you wanted to uh, uh, synthesize Advil in your kitchen, you could do it. Uh, it wouldn't be very pure. I wouldn't advise you to... Uh, uh, to take some, but you could do it. If you want to synthesize these, what we call recombinant viruses, these gene therapy uh, 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 products, this is highly complex, and this requires to uh, put in place the most complex sets of biotechnological methods that we uh, know of today. And it is so complex that the production, the manufacturing, is really rate limiting. Manufacturing for one patient, for instance, a patient affected with a neuromuscular disease, you have to inject 10 to the 15 of these particles per patient. And it means in terms of cost of manufacturing, it's several hundreds of thousands of dollars or euros per patient. And some of these drugs, and in particular one drug which was which comes from our labs and which is today uh, commercialized by a large uh, pharmaceutical company uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, commercialized at a cost of 2 million euros per treatment. So these are the most expensive treatments around. But it works. 
The first successful treatment using gene therapy was done here at Hôpital Necker in Paris for bubble babies. These babies are called bubble babies because due to a genetic mutation, they have no immune system, no immune system at all. So they are not able to survive in the atmosphere uh, which uh, all of us can breathe today because it's full of you know, microorganisms. And these kids will die in a, a time lapse of uh, two to three weeks after birth due to just you know, uh, uh, infection. So they have to be put under, under sterile bubbles in order to survive, and they will survive for a couple of years, three years, four years. Now, the first gene therapy treatment was able to correct this gene of the immune system and to take for the first time these bubble babies out of the bubble. And we now have kids, well, adolescents, teenagers, the age of 15, 20, several hundreds of them around the world who live a normal life thanks to gene therapy. You see kids affected with neuromuscular disease, spinal muscular atrophy, which kills kids before the age of two. No kid will survive uh, after the age of two. These kids cannot breathe on their own. They cannot sit. They can never walk. And now we have a gene therapy treatment which, uh, was, uh, for which initial research was done in our lab, which has been administered for to, more than, to approximately 2,500 uh, 2, kids around the world. And we now have kids around age five, six, seven, who go to school and who lead a normal life. You have Jules here uh, in the, center, uh, in the uh, center photograph, which is a kid affected with a rare uh, neuromuscular disease called myotubular myopathy. Before getting the treatment, he could not walk, he could not breathe on his own, he could not talk, he could not sit, he could not uh, do, I mean, it was basically a rag puppet. Now, uh, two years after treatment, this kid, he rides a tricycle, he goes up the stairs, and he never talked before. His parents say that he talks too much. Uh, so these are the examples of what gene therapy, which is really, which cures pathologies at their root, where attacking the molecular basis, can bring uh, to these kids. Now, what's the link with space? Uh, because after all, this is the topic of our uh, this is the, the topic of the roundtable today. The link with space. Well, I told you these uh, drugs they're very complex to be designed. We need a vector which is today a virus, but uh, we know that we need better vectors. These vectors are very difficult to manufacture, and we need better methods. And what we know is that microgravity changes biological objects. It changes their properties. And what we would like from space research is the capacity of assembling new types of vectors that we cannot assemble here on Earth <laughs> to assemble better vectors, more specific, more efficient, to come up with production methods due to microgravity that would be more efficient than here on Earth. And that's what we expect from the future of uh, biomedical research in space. But what I can tell you already is that our research is useful for space research. On the contrary, we have been working a lot on neuromuscular disease. We have been identifying factors which are important in neuromuscular wasting. And we have been identifying factors that can prevent neuromuscular wasting, not only in pathological setting, not only in disease, but also in aging, and we do believe that some of these protective factors could be useful for astronauts after a long stay uh, outside Earth in the outer space. So we do believe that there's really a crosstalk between the types of research we do and space research. Space research can help us doing better products, and we can help space research in uh, helping the astronauts. Yeah, you're you. king. You answer the second question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we used to say that space industry is very difficult, but sure, you show us that gene therapy is another challenge very, for the humanity, and it's very interesting to, to develop this kind of medicine because it's, it's, it's the future of medicine, it's the future of humanity too. Yeah, it's, in some extent, it's, it's also a new frontier. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Nicolas.
I can, I can, how can I introduce you? You're a serial entrepreneur. <laughs> you are very important for French people. You are, you, you know, you know very well in wine. You know very, you are working on wine. It's quite interesting, quite important for us. And you develop, you build a hotel in uh, California and so on. What is your, what is your guide? What, what guides you regarding this, uh, this? Well, I, what quest? guides me is what Frederick was telling. I think it's uh, impact, uh, super inspiring uh, the work you do, and obviously the way you put space in motion. So I'm an entrepreneur. I, I created for the past 30 years uh, nine startups. Um, so, and I do believe, as you said. Uh, Rafaela, that uh, yes, uh, one person and a group of persons very well motivated can change the world. And that's what has driven me uh, all throughout these various uh, endeavor. Um, I'm also a humanist, and I think that uh, technology and science can forge a better path and a better future. I'm sure a lot of people in the audience believe in this too. Unfortunately, it's uh, somehow challenged these days, so it's good to remind us that... Uh, the type of work you do, Frederic, uh, make a better future for humanity. So I really looked at uh, what I've done in the past, and always I've been very curious to see how you can get uh, scientific innovation, the best R&D, into actual practical motion in everybody's life, and it's a challenging path. I mean, by construct, uh, research is something very abstract, and getting actual output out of the lab into the life of people is what has driven me, this commercial go-to-market, if I may say. So I really believe in science for good, but also believe that... Uh, there's a lot of opportunity to create a, a better future thanks to space. And I think, Frédéric, you, you summed it all. My, my belief is that a lot of the examples my colleagues on the panel shared were leveraging satellite data to change the way we see the world, the way to change we understand what's happening on the planet. But I feel that the, the biggest frontier of new space is microgravity. And microgravity is the underdog of new space. The underdog because for so many years, uh, research has been done on the International Space Station. It's been amazing, uh, and, and there are great people in the room working on many projects. I saw Frédéric from, from, and, and a lot of people from uh, CNES working on uh, the future of, of research, but it's rarely becoming an actual impactful product, uh, changing lives um, in the field of life science and thinking on new materials. And this is what, uh, with the team at Space Cargo Unlimited, we aim to challenge, is bring this research to practical output on Earth and make a better future, a better life for humanity. Um, so when you look at, at uh, all the research done, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly interesting to see that uh, microgravity, as, as Frederic was saying, is, is uh, not well known because gravity is everywhere on Earth, everywhere. But uh, let me give you two practical uh, things to, to appreciate. Um, new materials, you ma merge two materials. The, on Earth, the heavy one goes down, the light one goes up. If you remove gravity, you make a perfect alloy, and it changes everything. To build any construction of tomorrow and the day after, we need better alloy. Space can allow us to build them. Life science is even better. Uh, what is great about microgravity is the change of status. When you go from solid to liquid or, or, or gas, well, there are things on Earth that make things obviously affected by gravity. When you remove gravity, you can make much purer, much more simpler um, nano capsules that are going to inject medicines into the body because they're better designed. You can work on, and that's what we we done, on also leveraging uh, the immense power of of uh, and the stress related to microgravity. So let me tell you what we've done. We did a mission with Space Cargo Limited on the future of ag agriculture. Agriculture is obviously quite important because that's the way we can survive by eating every day. And as you know, with 10 billion people and, and a challenging evolution of climate on Earth, there are many, many uh, challenges uh, in the way we'll be able to grow food to, to feed everyone on Earth. Um, we decided to focus on that hard topic on how we're going to create the agriculture of tomorrow. And we focused on viticulture. Yes, Gilles, uh, wine is something of importance to uh, French people, Italian people, and people around the world. It's a 340 billion industry. Uh, it's going to be a 475 billion industry by 2030. So it is a growing habit of drinking wine. But because there's a lot of money involved, it's also bringing a lot of research and a lot of quality scientists, which we leverage. And what you learn by growing vine plants, you can grow into carrots, into vegetables that are broadly going to feed humanity tomorrow. Uh, 
So the promise is how do we grow things on a warmer earth with less water? Well, you need to have plants that are more resilient, plants that are more able to cope with these challenge of extreme heat, of less water, of growing disease. And that's why we aim to find thanks to microgravity, thanks to space. Why? Well, for 4.7 billion years of life on Earth, the only parameter of life that has never evolved is gravity. All the others, temperature, humidity, brightness, have changed drastically. There were hundreds of years of darkness after a meteor fell on Earth that killed the dinosaurs and everything in that ecosystem. There were ice age and then there were warmer age. That's changed and species died and evolved and new species were created. Now, when you look at humanity today, we are on a planet. People say often that we are anxious for the future of the planet. The truth is the planet will be fine with two or three degrees Celsius more. Humanity will die. Every species that is in our ecosystem will die. But new species will evolve and, and be created and something else happen. So I'm very anxious because I feel that humanity needs to take action for the ownership of finding solutions as much as for our own future. So back to us. We wanted to create organic plant, organic that is untouched by genetic modification made by humans that would be more resilient to climate change. And we decided to use microgravity and the absence of gravity like a boot, boot camp. A boot camp. An ability for these plants that would survive microgravity to become stronger to deal with lesser stresses than the output stress of absence of gravity. Because, because gravity didn't change for all these 4.5 billion years, it became the backbone of life. Your heart is a pump optimized for pumping the blood from the bottom of your heart, bottom of your body to, to your brain. Uh, it's optimized for that, but when you go to the very small level of granularity of a human body, gravity is everywhere. The physical uh, aspects affecting cells and their evolution is gravity. So when you remove gravity, you create a stress that is immense, a stress that is super hard to cope. So we decided to put living organism plants at a very early age, pretty much one week after we cut these vines you see on the right end of the screen, we put them on the International Space Station for 10 months in partnership with the Cadmos Lab from CNES and a wonderful team at INRAE from the Institut des Sciences de la Vigne et du Vin. You see Professor Cluzet here that cut the vine tree uh, and, and put some of these little canes straight into a specific equipment we beat with Professor Michael Lebert, our chief scientist officer and our team, straight into the ISS for 10 months. And these plants, these kinds, were exposed to the absence of gravity. They were stressed like anything, the hardest stress ever. When they came back, we planted them along with the ground control and they changed completely behavior. We had some plants that grew very fast with no roots, and died. We had plants that didn't grow that much, but we have plants that grew much faster with roots and became effectively a new variety of vine plants. You see in the middle, that's the analysis of the defense gene mechanism. They, they actually are different. So we have effectively created a new variety of vine plants, which because it's resisted the stress of microgravity is now able to cope with lesser stresses that are related to climate change. They resist better to heat, to extreme heat, to uh, de dehydration. And they also resist to mildew and other fungi in a much more effective manner. And that is something we were extremely excited about. And as we continue to wait for the cycles of life to produce, we feel that we have now uh, these two varieties of vines that we created, Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon, will create by 24 uh, uh, plants that will be organic and more able to cope with the climate change. It's super important because $400 billion of, of an industry is big. Uh, there's 3.2 million hectares of vine uh, in, um, in the wine country of Europe. And, and every year we need to replant. So planting plants that are more resilient to climate change is something of importance. Now what we learn here too is making us extremely optimistic because we'll be able to bring this knowledge to, again, other plants other vine plants, but other plants, and we intend to grow a series of, of uh, missions moving forward to create the plants that will feed humanity tomorrow. I have to say that as an entrepreneur, and going back to the startup point, we're also quite proud that we uh, created the first uh, successful commercial in-space mission because we really did all this with private funding. 
uh, with a lot of creativity, we also put uh, bottles of wine on the space station, which we auctioned and were sold at a very expensive price and funded our 15 researcher, the INRAE uh, Research Partnership, along with a partnership with the FIU and Langen in Germany. And also that was funded by this creative idea of, of aging bottles of wine on the, on the space station and auctioning them at a very high price. So that's really also something we'll pride because Funding is hard to find, particularly with research program, particularly research program in space. And I think that Space Cargo has also a lot of ideas in the way to do the proper go-to-market, to move projects such as the research we do on vine canes. Um, and we have many new projects. We feel that, uh, and I made a list of a few, uh, protein crystallization, bulk metallic glass, z optic fibers, Micro-encapsulation are some of the many, along with, uh, I guess, genetic research that Frédéric was talking about, that we will bring forward and we'll make some announcement later this year on a very bold initiative to create the research lab and factory of the future to invent all these products that humanity can benefit from on Earth. Perhaps so stay two, tuned. Yeah, perhaps in two minutes. Uh, we are deeply convinced that uh, the future of space is the connection between research center, big company, startup, and perhaps space agency, we hope so. Um, how do you work with all these people? It's, it is challenging because we have different <laughs> cultures, we have different rhythm, we have different dynamics. Um, but really what, what we're trying to bring with the 15 people, men and women working at, at Space Cargo Limited, it's really this cultural diversity. Uh, first, there's an ability to find uh, with a new frontier that search a research in space is. Then, as I said, it's being very pragmatic about rigorous project management, because as you well know, it's hard to get in space, it's expensive, and then, you know, very effective go-to-market. So these vine plants, for instance, we will bring back, are growing in the, in the, warehouse, in the greenhouse of Inrae, and in 24, we signed a partnership with Mercier, which is one of the biggest uh, um, uh, wine nursery, and we intend to sell these uh, vines to uh, all the Italian, uh, French, uh, Napa Valley based uh, vine plants, and that's really the, all this cycle going from the research to uh, the project management to the creative funding mechanism to the actual go to market that we've been working hard to learn how to do. I think that to answer your question, Gilles, it's impact. It's really always knowing what it is for. In Bordeaux, uh, alcoholic level of the wine in the 70s was 11 degrees of alcohol. Sometimes you had to have sugar which was forbidden to finish the wine making. Today, you no need to add sugars. The vine and the wine gets to 14 degrees of alcohol. And if you look 20 years down the line, we may be unable to produce uh, wine in Bordeaux. Okay, fine, wine will be produced in other places, but really fine and not fine, because when you look at that from a, that angle, then every other agricultural challenges we'll have will be trying the same. So the mission takes over all the cultural differences and make us do the thing we do to try to be uh, effective and impactful for humanity. Wow, thank you, thank you. I think it's over now, time is over. I just thank you all for, for this discussion. I think uh, space is everywhere for everyone, and thank you for coming and help us to understand what's going on in the industry, what's, how can you, can you help us, a space industry, to develop our business. Thank you very much. I think I have to give the floor to a uh, representative of the European Commission, Ms. Papa Antonio. Uh, is it possible to come on the floor? No? Okay. Then perhaps uh, here's a band of uh, Eric Boussari, and you have to go to the welcome reception, and we will drink a good wine, good French wine. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.